barber shops look brilliant there. Oh man! I mean, yeah. man, they, none of them look like you know, yeah. none of them look like they've been chucked around for a fiver. And this is what I never quite understand. I keep hearing that all these barbers opening up are fronts and laundry, money laundry. Yeah. I'm like, I don't understand it because yeah. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're yeah. spending so much money on these shops. The barbers themselves really kind of working on their image. It, yeah. Everybody looks really good. And then we're selling 15 quid haircuts. I do feel like barbers still don't charge as much as what they should charge because... I have um, conversation all the time. Some of the people that enter a barber shop is still, I'm just going to the barbers to go and get short back and sides. But even a short back and sides, there's still an element of understanding behind. It's not just a case of like, I'm just going to shave it all off yeah. and that's it. It's like, again, it's working with the head shape. It's like, okay, you want a fade. It's not just a fade. If you think about these barber shops that are outside of town, like 20 pound, mm. 15 pound, um, and it's a shame, you know. You know, it's a tough way to make a living. Talking about the money, I done this. Um, I done this show in Barcelona three weeks ago, and obviously I don't speak Spanish, so I've got this translator. And I was working on a variation of a mullet. I don't know how it translates, what mullet translates to in Spanish, but the guy basically said, shallot. I said, like, what's a shallot? And he said, it's basically a mix between a shag haircut and a mullet. Shallot. Oh, right, so yeah, yeah. You can't really do anything different because everything's pretty much been done. It's just how can you sort of mix different haircuts yeah. now and make it your own. Yeah. So, but you look at some. I mean, genuinely, the mullet. I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, it's not what it was like. I was like, there. Yeah, it wasn't. There yeah. was no talent involved yeah. in the old mullet. Just grab it yeah. and just cut it and just leave it, it on the back, isn't it? And yeah, no, yeah. So I do think we've really not, like you say, we've not just kind of progressed. We've taken it to a whole nother level. Welcome to The Noble Barber. This is a podcast for barbers by barbers, cutting through the crap of the industry. We all want to know how our businesses can run better. I want to talk to people who've done it, messed it up and got it right second time round and can tell us the way that you and I can make our businesses better. Welcome to another episode of The Noble Barber. Hi there. I'm here today with Kevin Luckman. Um, and yeah, well, I just want to... We've just been sitting chatting about your story and your yeah. journey and, and it's kind of evolved quietly into an entire kind of story of barbering, the barbering journey. Yeah. But you started off, I was surprised, I didn't realise, as a barber. Correct. Became a hairdresser and now... Back into barbering. <laughs> Full circle around. So how did, tell us that, um, how did that come about? So I mean, like, you know, I've told this story like a million times, but it's kind of... The long story short behind it yeah. is, you know, 17 years old, you know, back in the day, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I think at this point I was, I was at college, I was studying travel and tourism, nothing to do with hairdressing. Right. Um, because when that's I was, coming in handy now, I know, though, which, isn't it? which is great. <laughs> Again, that's really crazy because it's like back when I was, back when I was younger, like I wanted to travel the world. Mm. I wanted to see different countries and then crazy enough, like I'm doing hair and traveling and seeing different yeah. countries, which is quite nice. So yeah, 17, um, studying travel and tourism at college. I had a shaving head. One of my friends wanted his hair cut, started cutting his hair. And then from there, basically started cutting my other friend's hair. And then that's when I decided to go back to college, study hairdressing. Um, but I was more interested in the men's mm. barbering side of things. So along with that, I was working part-time at a barbershop. I was there for about uh, three, four years, gaining my experience. And as we was talking... You know, back then, barbering was very different to what Proper it is now. Yeah, I'm talking five, five pound haircut. Yeah. You know, it was very much rent a chair. I think it was like 40 pound for the day. You know, however many haircuts you've done, you kept obviously, you know, your profit from after you've given uh, the rent. And then, yeah, basically four years into it, wanted to learn about hairdressing, wanted to learn about longer lengths of hair. And at this point, because I was at college, I was going to like Salon International. And that's when I really started to see how big the industry was mm. and the other side to the industry. Was there um, much men's hair work going on at, in those days of no, Salon International? It was, do you know, it was very, it was very small back in Salon International, let, let's say, you know, what, 2000 and, 2007? Because mm. I still got photos, obviously taken from like a Polaroid camera, <laughs> um, you know, and it's got the little date and like the time oh, on the cool. side. Yeah, so, yeah, nice to um, keep that. Yeah, man. That's really, yeah, really keep yeah. ones. And it's, um, that, those those were even photos of me back when I was um, actually on stage at Salon International. And this is the crazy wow. story behind that: is the the photos of me on stage at Salon International 2007 was when I was actually working and I had the opportunity to work on the Anders stand. Oh, so, wow. this, so this was when Andis was, um, I think it was Denman was a distributor for Andis back yeah. in the day. 
And yeah, I worked for this guy that basically worked for Andy. So I had the opportunity to work on the Andy stage and then full circle around now, I'm working for Andy. So, well yeah. so um, yeah, but anyway, going, going back to the hairdressing side was mm. Salon International. I saw, you know, the different stages and I saw Tony and Guy had the biggest mm. stage. And I wanted to learn about ladies hairdressing, wanting to learn about how to cut longer lengths of hair, blow drying. So then after four years of barbering, went to work for Tony and Guy. And then that's basically when I really was just like, wow, like there's so much to hair than just cutting hair. Yeah. You know, there was a styling element to hair. You know, I found out Tony Guy down the fashion weeks, you know, and then all the art directors who would travel around the world. And then for me, I've got a very obsessive personality. If I want to do something, I want to be the best at it. And I basically thought to myself, like, if I'm going to work for Tony Guy, I don't just want to be a stylist behind the chair. I want to really work my way up to becoming an art director. And then, um, yeah, you know, within my years, I think it was about 11, 12 years of Tony Guy, I worked my way up to become an art director, um, headed up the men's course in the academy, traveled around the world, done the campaigns, done the shows, um, done the awards, British Hedges Awards, finalists, won it as well. And then 2017, ticked all the boxes and yeah. decided, you know, at this point with Tony Guy towards the backer end, I was really focusing on like men's, you know, for the company. And my clientele in the salon was probably, I'd say, 75, 80% men anyway. And then, um, yeah, 2017, left the company, set up my own business. And then, yeah, just done the education, um, which is, you know, I, I was working underneath my own brand, traveling the world, still doing photography, because that's another bit of the, you know, my part of my business that I do is photography and videography. So we're still doing like, um, you know, shooting for the British Hairdressing Awards for myself and other companies as well. And then, yeah, 2020 happened, COVID hit. And then that changed everything because, you know, my whole business model was traveling the world. Mm. And, and that took a long time oh, to get back yeah. to normal. Well, you know, the, the crazy thing is, you know, you, you think, I mean, it was a long, it mm. felt like mm. years. Um, but, you know, it was, obviously it was like under a year and then it went up and down, you know, lockdown happened and then we'd be back open again. Um, but then that's when a lot, changed in my perspective in everything not just about the industry but just about life as well mm. um so to sort of rewind just a little bit before covid 2020 2019 my son was born so when he was born that really changed my mindset on everything um you know like how you know do i want to travel as much do i want to be away from mm. the family um and then yeah 2020 happened so obviously 2020 covid he was um, turning one and then uh, that's the thing with COVID it was obviously it was hor horrible it was horrendous mm. but then it changed a lot in my mindset because I got to spend a lot of time with him I got to spend a lot of time with yeah. my wife and then it made me realise okay what is really important you know back then I'm travelling around the world I'm meeting all these people I'm on these massive shows and you know people are flying me you know all, all around America Brazil Mexico, Japan, Korea. I went everywhere and it was amazing. But then I think when you have children, it makes you realize, okay, what's really important in life. Um, and I've got this, I've got my second one on the way as well. And it's, it's now it's like, it's, Excellent. you know, my family for me, everyone that knows me on a personal level, they know that my family is everything. Mm. Um, and even companies that I work with now, I'm always like, you know, I, I will work with what works well for me. Like I, I want to be, it's not like I want to get to the job and do the job and go home straight away, but I want to be minimal time mm. spending doing nothing, basically. You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then we're here, 2024, you know, um, still traveling around the world, still doing, obviously, my, my photography. I'm associated with Andis now, still do a lot of work for them, and yeah. It's, it's, it's been a journey. So did 2020 and the lockdown, I see you're doing a lot of your education well, there's a big section of it that's online. Mm -hmm. Was that born out of the kind of lockdown or or has um, that been something you've introduced more recently? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the like the online education, I started, I actually launched that in 2019 because I launched that in 2019 um, because when I became independent, like because I do photography, I like mm. shooting new campaigns, I like shooting new stuff of mine stuff. Um, and I like showcasing my own work, you know, uh, alongside with that, course every year when i'm shooting 
I submit that work to the British Hairdressing Award. So it kind of like, you know, it all ties in together. And I started in 2019 with the online education just because I thought, right, if I'm going to shoot these models that I'm cutting, I might as well get someone to record them and I might as well do something with it. Yeah. And then obviously with lockdown, then I started to push that a bit more because then I started doing a bit more lives, you know, like a lot mm. of people done. And now where everything's gone back to normal, like I still have got my online education, like I'm working on it, but then there's other things that I'm working on. It's, it's a lot of work to do yeah. online stuff and to do it proper, like it's, it is a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, but photography definitely shows through because your website looks beautiful, man. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, photography is a massive passion of mine. Like, I enjoy doing it. Um, it was one of those ones I kind of, uh, again, when I was working for Tony and Guy because I was working in central London, I came across great models, you know, mm. that we'd do at the shows, that we'd do in the campaigns. And I always kind of made an effort to do a lot of stuff outside of work. So... For example, I'd be working in the academy nine till six, or sometimes nine till seven, yeah. eight, whenever it finished, um, teaching. But then what I'd always do, and a lot of people that I used to work with, they would always be like, you're, you're crazy. Why are you staying behind after work and cutting someone's hair? And I'm like, because, oh, well, one, I enjoy cutting hair, and two, it's content for mm -hmm. social media. So what I would end up doing is after the academy would finish, you know, I'd call a, upon a couple of my friends that were models, I'd cut their hair, and then that's when I'd, invested in a camera and then I would just practice. So I would just practice up in the, the studio in the academy, taking photos, doing street photography, and then one thing led to another. You know, I'd get two models, make a small little mini collection. Uh, my colleagues would see what I was doing and I was like, oh, could you shoot a collection for me? And then it would turn into doing that and then I'd be like, oh, let's shoot for the British Hairdressing Awards or L'Oreal yeah, Colour yeah. Trophy or Wele Trend Vision. And then that sort of starts to spiral the effect that people was like, oh, Kev doesn't just cut hair. He's yeah, a photographer yeah. as well. So, um, And the nice thing with doing that as well is, you know, I still keep relationships with people that I've worked with before um, from a photography level as well. And, you know, I've traveled with photography, you know. Obviously, I've shot, shot a lot for Tony and Guy, shot a lot of um, finalist collection, winning collections. I've shot a lot of guys from um, Australia as well for the Australian Hairdressing Awards won their collections, guys in America as well. We seem to well. do quite well in Oz at the moment. Yeah. We've got a good, we've got a very good track record, the Brits yeah. getting involved in the Aussie Awards. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Australian Hairdressing Awards, I, I even think, you know, they they really push the boundaries of um, mm. creating really cool, really do, don't they? you know, hairstyles and thinking outside the box. And there's a lot of, you know, English photographers that shoot collections mm. over in Australia as well, which is nice. There's always been a bit of it. I guess, historically, there's always been those two camps that there's, there's been the barbering, which I guess was your mm. kind of origin place. And then um, hairdressing. And they seem like very different worlds. There was a kind of snobbery both ways yeah, yeah. from barbers to hairdressers and vice versa. Yeah. And that seems to be kind of blurring out a lot more now. Hairdressers yeah. I speak to uh, are quite, imp you know, very impressed with barbers and wanting to do barbering course. I'm seeing more education places almost specialise in getting quality hairdressing, but mm. but teaching them solid barbering yeah. skills. You know, if I think back in the day when I was with Tony and Guy and, you know, you know even before Tony and Guy, you know, barbering was very much, like I said, it was in a class of its own. Mm. Like in the sense that it was very much barbering and hairdressing. And you know, I don't even mind saying this because it's the truth. If there was no people didn't really respect barbers. People thought barbering was very much, as we were saying, like it was very much in and out, you know, 50-minute haircuts, do it as fast as you can. And then I think what's what started to happen was education. Mm. You know, barbers started to realise, you know, there's, there's more to then just fading. So it's obviously working to that next stage of like, how do you combine longer lengths of hair, hairdressing, you know, styling hair, blow drying, you know, all that element of it. And I think now, especially with social media, there's there's a lot of barbers that really wanted to learn about like longer lengths of hair. And I think now it's, um, they pretty much have merged together, you know, like barbers can pretty much do everything that hairdresser can do now. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, there's within restrictions, but, you know, barbers, they want to learn about sectioning patterns. They want to learn about like texturizing techniques. They want to learn how can you work with styling and doing things differently. And if if I really think about it now, there's a very, very strong, like strong crew of barbers out there that deliver excellent mm. education. Um, 
that are independent artists. And if I think about how it was back in the day, it was very much like, you know, it'd be like the Sassoons, it'd be the Tony and Guys, it'd be the Rush, it'd be the Headmasters, all those people that would be traveling to do education. Now you're getting actual individuals yeah. that will travel around the world. Um, and it's amazing, you know, it's, it's amazing. And it's amazing how much the barbering community and industry has grown so mm. much, you know, and they do beautiful work. And there's a hunger, you know, there really mm. is. You know, when I, you know, from doing this, I talked to lots and um, there is a kind of eagerness and enthusiasm to, you know, I don't know if it's all just Instagram led mm. of, of just seeing the work that's going out there, but it's amazing work going out. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, and I think that's what's, the beauty with that is that, with social media as people can see what other people are doing mm. as well. And, you know, if we think about how it was back in the day, it's like if you want to see what was happening over in America or what was happening in Australia or happening in Europe, you had to go to those shows. Yeah. You had to know people. You had to speak to them. Now you can very much just go on your social media, go to people that are based in that country and see what's happening. Like this weekend just gone, there was the um, ABS in Chicago, the um, uh, American Beauty uh, show. In Chicago, and is um, you know, I done it last year, and there's a massive section of barbering, and you can see what's happening. You can, you know, obviously the um, the team of people that I work with, Andis, they're over there. I can see the amazing work that they're mm. doing, and it's just so cool to see, you know, everyone working together now. You know, which is nice. You know, you, you see the section section of barbering not just being tucked in the corner. You know, it shows how it used yeah. to be back in the day. It's all like dotted around. It's its own section itself, which is yeah. so nice. And seeing now, I mean, you know, we've got Modern Barber, you, yeah, know, yeah. you know, really Barber quality. Connect shows well, yeah. Bernard, Barber Connect starting. Yeah. You know, everywhere seems to have that inclusion of barbering or barbering doing its own thing, but to a really high quality, mm. you know, it's been a real lift, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's nice because I do feel like the, the barbering industry has really elevated a lot. Mm. You know, there's been... Like I said, I mean, there's a lot of big hitters like in the barbering industry that are making a lot of noise, traveling the world. Um, and I'm proud to say like a lot of these are from the UK, which is so yeah, nice no, because really it's like it. it's, you know, us being such a small island mm. in the world, like we are making so much noise um, around the world. Mm. You know, like I said, I travel around the world and, you know, I get to meet amazing artists and see what people are doing and... And are we doing very different? Are we doing it very differently, or are we just better at, at, at talking it up? Or is the kind of <laughs> energy that I seem to see contagious when they when Brits take it abroad? Uh, do you know what I think it is with the Brits? I think we're very we're very um, what's the word? We're very precise in what we do, and we we like when we're, I find with Brits whenever we're learning something, we want we want to know basically the ins and outs of mm. things. You know, we want to, whatever we're teaching, we want to back it up with true knowledge. Um, and I feel like we really do push the boundaries. Mm. You know, I do feel like London, you know, is really the center hub of creativity, of fashion, of forward thinking, of pushing the boundaries and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's everywhere that I go around the world, people always say, oh yeah, L London's really pushing new things and trying out new things. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people around the world are doing that. But, you know, if we think about it, you go around London, you know, you, you go around East London, you can get so much inspiration yeah. from so many different people and then try new things. You can try whatever you want to try with any yeah. people like around London, which is I amazing. Know, you, you, start, know? you know, you start looking at the barbering hashtags across Instagram and, mm. and we're covering everything now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, which is incredible. Yeah. You know, the, whether it is, you know, there used to be kind of a great fear amongst barbers and hairdressing of tech of you know that textured hair hair mm -hmm. with with you know um life in it mm -hmm. and um and you're seeing so many courses now that involve texturing mm -hmm. so many people not just doing it yeah, pushing I, it and promoting it and doing yeah. it so brilliantly yeah i think with london as well it's like we we're, we're just so fortunate that we're so diverse mm -hmm. in london as well it's like you've got every single culture ethnicity yeah. in london which is amazing because when you, like you said, you know, you're thinking about like the textured haircuts and stuff like that. Like that's very much in now, the long, soft, like, and you're just getting everyone that wants to try new things, mm. you know? And I feel like in London as well, especially when you see creative people, they want to be different. Yeah. Like they want to have something that's, they don't necessarily want something that's in fashion right now. They want to be forward thinking into like, oh, do something completely different. different, yeah. And they will give you ideas into what to do to try and push yourself as creative people, which is yeah. nice.
No, definitely. And I think you're seeing that with, you know, I mean, I think probably when we first started doing this kind of coming up a year ago, I guess, there was the talk of the kind of Oasis 90s haircuts coming mm. back. And now when you look, I can guess you can see the influence in it, but they're really not. Yeah. You know, they're definitely kind of, you know, you know, a, a whole, re, not a revisit, they're a rebirth, the haircuts. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think the kind of, the mullets back, it's not, man. Yeah. I mean, it's a really yeah. different show. I mean, you know, there's a basic length yeah. of the back and shorter yeah. bit. But you look at some of these haircuts that are being kind of nudged as a mullet, and they ain't. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're haircuts do, do you know in their own really right. Talking, talking about the mullet, I done this. Um, I done this show in Barcelona three weeks ago, and obviously, I don't speak Spanish, so I've got this translator, and I was working on a variation of a mullet, and. Um, I don't know how it translates, what mullet translates to in Spanish, but the guy basically said, Charlotte. And I said to him, I was like, oh, whatever you said. So the guy who was actually translating for me was Sergi from Aesthetic Magazine. So he's the... Um, oh, okay, yeah. He's so the, he's the um, industry-wise. Yeah, yeah, so he's the he's the editor of the um, um, Aesthetic Magazine. And he said to me, he's like, oh, what they're starting to talk about now is this Charlotte. And I, I was like, what's a Charlotte? And he said, it's basically a mix between a shag haircut and a mullet. Shallow. Uh, right, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting now. I mean, like you said, I mean, how can you, how can, you can't really do anything different because everything's pretty much been done. It's just how can you sort of mix different haircuts yeah. now and make it your own? Yeah. So but you look at some, I mean, genuinely, the mullet, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, it's not what it was like. I was like, there, yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, there was yeah. no talent involved yeah. in the old mullet. Just grab it yeah. and just cut it and just lift it, it, it the back, isn't it? And yeah, no, yeah, so I do think we've really not, like you say, we've not just kind of progressed. We've taken it to a whole other level. You yeah, know? I mean, we've, we've made things a lot more tasteful now. And I think we've done, uh, what we've done now is very much, we're taking a lot into consideration. Mm. So we're taking suitability, we're taking head shape, you know, hair texture, you know, we're taking all those different elements into consideration to make it suit the individual. Yeah. Because as we know, as hairdressers, as barbers, you know, we really want to make that haircut bespoke for that individual. Mm. It's not a one fit everyone haircut which it was basically back in the day like oh, I said yeah, it was no, just definitely. right you want a short top cut it you want it long in the back let's leave it that's it let's cut yeah, the things yeah. like this done no it was you took yeah. a picture of him with someone he's like I want to look like a celebrity you yeah, just yeah. get a short back and size and it was like that's how he get his haircut if he yeah, came yeah. in and I, I, it was I, I just remember, awful I remember when I was younger I think obviously when I had hair um, I think back then it was like all like about you know Backstreet Boys you know like all, in, all around those like 90s eras and I remember having the curtains and having the undercut, but what I wanted was basically the um, the curtains to fall over the undercut. Uh, and then it's just, it's so interesting because even now you're getting people that want a curtain haircut. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah. I, I can almost in. see your barber's oh, face when God. you were trying to explain yeah. that to me. Like, yeah, you finished, yeah, I've been you finished audio... talking now, son. Uh, right, there you go. <laughs> literally, oh, yeah, yeah, short back and size. That's all you're giving. <laughs> what, whatever you ask for, you just, that's the thing. Back in the day, it's like whatever you'd ask for, you just get given whatever you the barber You got bar given what the, what the barber did, <laughs> Basically, and that was it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's really interesting. Individualism is really exactly what's happened to our industry yeah. completely. There's not that kind of chucking it out. Yeah. It is. You know, we've become experts yeah. and, and we're I, starting to believe that we're experts, which is, you know, which is a kind of growing up thing. Yeah. It's not, we're, we're experts. We're really good at this. Yeah. And I think, I think that's so nice. And I think, I think we know it as stylists, as hairdressers and barbers, like we know we've become experts. We know that we've invested a lot of time mm. and effort into education and financially as well. Um, but the one thing that I do always, and this is talking more from the barbering um, side is I do feel like barbers still don't charge as much as what they should charge because I have um, that conversation all the time. Yeah, and it's it is such a shame because I think the mentality of people that enter some of the people that enter a barber shop is still I'm just going to the barbers to go and get a short back and sides. But even a short back and sides, there's still an element of understanding behind. It's not just a case of like I'm just going to shave it all off yeah. and that's it. It's like again, it's working with the head shape. It's like okay, you want a fade. It's not just a fade. You need to understand, is that fade going to suit that individual? Is it going to shoot, suit what's happening on the length on top? And I feel like the the, ups, the upsetting thing is, is that we there's a lot of hairdressers out there that are still charging a lot of money. And again, it's like, I, I don't name drop and it's not that I'm having a rant. It's not that I'm saying it's bad. It's just facts of what I'm saying. So there's a lot of hairdressers out there that would be charging a man, let's just say, 50, 60, 70 pounds for a haircut that they're happy to pay, but 
but then that man doesn't want to go to a barber shop because they still associate a barber shop with a short back and sides when yeah. they could probably give them a better haircut than what they'd get in the yeah. hairdressers um, because of the education that they've mm. got nowadays. Um, but then, you know, the barbers now are still only charging like, you know, let's say in London, 30, 30 pound, 40 pound, probably at the most for mm. a haircut. Like if you're going to central London, maybe a little bit more. But, you know, if you think about these barbershops that are outside of town, like £20, mm. £15, um, and it's a shame, you know. You know, it's a tough way to make a living. Yeah. You know. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, no, you know it. Put your prices up without any doubt yeah. at all. And it's, it's difficult because it's like, obviously, you, I think it, like anything, you want to charge what you're worth. Mm. But then it's like, you know, I talk to a lot of barbershop owners, you know, the, the only way, real way around it is to basically cut down either cut down the times and try and do it faster but then you need the time to do give it deliver yeah. a good haircut but then it's like do you then charge more money and then scare away your regular clients mm. and stuff like that but then no it's a tough game I mean, i'm starting to see <coughs> times on price lists now yeah. you know that they're saying 30 minutes 45 minutes yeah to kind of let you know that that's the time you know it's time you're buying and yeah, i always yeah. think from our point of view we're we're selling our time. It's not, yeah. I just happen to have a pair of scissors or a clipper in my hand. Yeah. It's the time with me that you're, yeah. you're paying it's, it's, for. It's a crazy one because the thing is, I think a lot of people will basically say, oh yeah, they go into a salon, they pay £50 for a haircut, but then they're only going every four to six weeks. Mm. They're opposed to that, they're going to a barber shop, they're charged, you're paying £20, £25 for a haircut, but they're going every two weeks. Mm. So it's like, okay, I get it. But then like I said, it's time is money. Mm. It's, uh, you know, and how, how do you sort of, try and manage that or how do you try and... But, you know, and equally, I mean, you know, you wander around and see them, you know, barbershops look brilliant now. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, man, they, none of them look like, you know, yeah, none yeah. of them look like they've been chucked around for a fiver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everyone's spending proper money yeah, yeah, yeah. and proper design and, mm. you know, it's there's money being spent. This is what I never quite understand. I keep hearing that all these barbers opening up are fronts and laundry, money laundry. Yeah, yeah. I'm like... Can't, I don't understand it because yeah. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're yeah. spending so much money on these shops. The barbers themselves really kind of working on their image. It, yeah. Everybody looks really good. And then we're selling 15 quid haircuts. Yeah, well, exactly. That's the thing. I think I feel like with um, barbering now, it's, it's, a, it's a culture, isn't it? It's a culture. It's a lifestyle. You know, people really want to be mm. a real part of it. You know, they, people feel nowadays, which is nice, that people will be proud to say like yeah I'm a barber yeah definitely you know like you know like I'm a barber but I do feel like um barbering now is is that hybrid approach is barbering men's hairdressing um which is so nice and it's so cool and especially like I said when I travel around the world and I get to see you know even like around the world some of these beautiful barber shops like you said they invest a lot of money into it like heavily um right. but you see and you know you flick through you can buy a, a, a hairdressing chair for Less than a hundred quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even a really bottom of the range barber chair is going to be five hundred quid. You're buying yeah, yeah, yeah. Belmont. You're doing yeah, two yeah. and a half, three, four. No, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, you yeah. got you walk past a barber that's got three or four Belmonts in it. You're yeah. looking at ten grand. Yeah, you know they spend money, isn't it? And you just kind of go, that's that's an investment. Yeah. Yeah, but you're meeting presumably that proper edge of the kind of creative side of our industry. Mm. Are you still doing a bit behind a chair somewhere? Do you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got I've got a studio in. Um, I actually do have a studio in East London, um, which is is kind of like a hybrid approach studio. So I've got two barber chairs there. I've like got the photography side of it as well. So that's kind that, of so you so you do <coughs> shoot studio work now. Yeah, yeah. So oh, right. it gives me the opportunity to obviously do photography in my studio. And then obviously work with, whether I'm working with like models or clients, mm. working with like, you know, other people that want to have like a uh, photography collection shot. But in regards to like clients, I'm saying <laughs> probably like four or five a month. Oh, okay. Like, so these these are like, <laughs> these are like diehard regulars, you know. <laughs> the ones you just can't shake off yeah, at all. Yeah, no, it's all right, Kev, I'll wait, mate, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, even one of my clients was so desperate to have his hair cut, like, you know. I've had people come in at like seven in the morning, six in the morning, like I said, sometimes come to my house. But these are clients that I've been cutting like over sure. 10 years, 10, 15. I think one of them, like, I've literally still cut his hair and I started cutting his hair when I was a Maidstone Tony guy, which is the first Tony guy that I worked wow. in. So I'm talking like 17 plus years ago. So, but it's one of those ones is like, it's the conversation, mm. it's the, the relationship that I have with the people. But 
I do really, really miss cutting hair behind mm. the chair. Like, I really do miss it. Yeah. Like, I think, you know, it's that whole culture of being in a barber shop. You know, like, you've got your clients, you've got your colleagues with their clients, everyone's having a conversation. You know, it's, it's that, that's when yeah. I feel like that's what I really, really miss. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I love traveling the world, doing what I do as an educator, but... Um, a lot of people don't see the other side to it, mm. which is the traveling. It's the waking up early in the morning. It's the, you know, I was in New York um, this weekend. No, sorry, not this week. Last weekend, just gone. Yeah, it sounds absolutely fancy, but it's like I'm having to wake up early in the morning. It's a seven hour flight. Um, I'm then having to like queue for like an hour and a half, two hours in the customs in, in New York, which is, I just hate American airports in that sense. It's like the customs are always so long. So I'm queuing up for an hour and a half. I'm busting for a piss. Mm -hmm. And part of me is like, do I go back, <laughs> go to the toilet, and then have to queue up queue again? again. Yeah. So I'm like holding it. Then you get to customs. They ask you a million questions about why you're in the country, how long you're here for, interrogate you. Then I'm having to wait for my luggage. Then I'm having to go from the train station to then go into like, um, where did I have to go? Grand Central. And then I'm having to then get another train to go up to Poughkeepsie, which is like two hours. And then I'm having to get then a cab to like go into the airport, go to sleep, uh, sorry, to the, uh, the hotel, go to sleep, wake up in the morning <laughs> and then go meet with the clients, go and put on a pretty face and then go and have to like showcase I'm jet lagged and then go to sleep that night, do the same thing next morning and then the day after then have to travel back and do it yeah. in reverse. No, I, mean, I think so, anyone that travels... Uh Everyone hates the travel yeah, bit. Yeah. And airports are getting worse. It's, yeah. it's just it's just hanging out and hanging around. Yeah. I don't like I don't I don't mind it, but it's like it's not as it's not it's as not glamorous. Glamour, yeah. yeah. And it's like even like, yeah, don't get me wrong, like I might fly a premium economy or or business class, but it's like I'm literally on that plane and going to sleep. Mm. It's like I need rest. Like, you know, especially you know, as I was well, what saying, what were you doing in the states? What was the what was the New York? Trip? So that was a um, it was a company called Vidal, which they've got like this. Um, it's like a barber shop, like creative space, a big space. And then I ended up doing a two day uh, class. So first day was look and learn. Second day was a hands on. Mm. So it was um, yeah, it was nice. Well received. Yeah, really good. Like you know, the hands on. I had twenty five people. The next day was uh, sold out on the hands on, which was eight people. But, you know, I'm doing that in New York, but I had people from, obviously I had people from New York City. I had two people from um, Houston, Texas. I had one person from LA um, and then a couple of people from Connecticut, just out of state from New York. Mm. So even though I'm doing it in New York, it was so nice to get They're people traveling around, through, yeah. Yeah. you know, which is um, always such a nice thing when you're- And all barbers? Uh, hybrid, so mm. hairdressers and barbers. So that's mm. the thing, a lot of hairdressers, what they want to learn is, they want to learn more the fading clipper work and then it's the barbers that they want to learn more of the hairdressing. Yeah. So then because I've got that hybrid approach of, you know, barbering and toning guy is figuring out a way, how can I deliver that and actually educate it properly yeah. across to the people, which is nice. But hoovered up, they're loving it. Oh yeah, yeah, they love it. They love it and I love it, you know. It's yeah. um, always such a great reception when I go to America. Oh, lovely. And when you're here though, so just going back to the kind of creative factor, if you're shooting for other people and that mm. kind of stuff, are you finding that you're shooting more with barbers that are coming up creative or are they more hairdressers that are doing menswear? Um, so, you know, the crazy, this, this is going to sound crazy. So, well, it's not crazy. So, even though I'm a barber, men's hairdresser, hairdresser, hybrid, however you want to call me, the majority of times when I actually shoot collections for people, it's not men's collections. Oh, do you not? It's all ladies' collections, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So don't get me wrong, there's been a few that I've shot men's collections for. Um, and the majority of people that I actually shoot men's collections for are actually are actually outside of the UK. So I've shot like um, a couple of guys from Spain, which they actually won uh, the Spanish hairdressing Figaro Awards. I think it was last year they won. Right. I shot some Australians for the men's hairdressing awards as well, which they actually won as well. Um, and in America as well, but in the UK, I think I think as well. Probably the reason why is because a lot of people from the UK know that I am. Yeah. I will shoot my collection for men's hairdresser. Yeah. So they probably that's going to really, knock mine. Yeah. So they know. Yeah, so they so they're like, <laughs> oh yeah, you want yeah. best for himself. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, you want to shoot a collection? I'm going to fuck this right up, basically. Um, but there has been. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There's a couple of like real close people of mine that I know that I've shot in the UK for like men's hairdressing. Uh, for British Hairdressing Awards, 
which, uh, you know, and of course when I'm shooting, like I'm very much photographer mode on. Mm. So I will actually help people and guide people within the collections. But as I said, I mean, like I've shot for London, I've shot avant-garde, I've shot um, North, I think North Eastern or Northwestern. You know, I've shot different regions for like British Heritage yeah. Awards and they're all, majority is basically female. Like last year, I think I got, I can't even remember, I think it was like maybe five or six finalists through for the British Heritage Awards. And the newcomer um, who won, I shot her collection last year. Oh, wow. So it's amazing that I get the opportunity to um, shoot. And I actually, to be fair, like I actually shoot, prefer shooting females um, because I feel like you can, like as a photographer, you can get them to move a bit more. You can be a bit more creative. Mm -hmm. You know, you can mix things up with men. It's a bit, you know, I wouldn't say you're restricted, but if you look at a lot of the men's hairdressing collections, a lot of it's very much headshots, portraits. It's yeah. about showcasing your skill on the haircut. Rather with females, it's very much how can you incorporate um, the clothes styling? How can you incorporate the makeup? How can you incorporate the photography, at the, you know, the set yeah. and all that sort of stuff? So, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. You got a collection in this year? Um not as of not as of yeah. I always leave. I was going to say the closing yeah. dates are already out, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it? After I think it's like June. I think it's around June. I think okay. that, yeah. I think it's around June. Like I always leave everything to the last minute. Always, and I always say to myself, I'm going to be organised this year, and then I leave it last minute. Um, and then even sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not going to shoot this year. I'm going to leave it out this year. But then it's like. I know the majority of agencies in London. I know so many male models. I mm. shoot myself. I have my own studio. It's stupid if them. I don't, basically. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, I, I personally, for myself, I don't have the pressure of having to shoot a collection in one day. I could mm. shoot one model each day if I really want to. Yeah. And if I've shot four models and I'm like, I don't like that one, I can always get another model and yeah. shoot it. So that's the advantage I have of shooting my own collection. And if doing that, do you find that you, do you get... Is it a vibe that you kind of follow and that ends up being kind of where your head's at and that's your collection? Or do you plot it? I speak to lots of people with different modes. You know, I, was, I chatted to uh, George Smith. Oh, the other yeah, yeah, um, yeah. he and, was know, a finalist and he won it, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And he's really giving it, you know, he plans it, plots it. Yeah. He works with um, Alex Baronhoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm still sell on, yeah. You know, they still. really kind of work what they're yeah, up to. I'm, I'm, Yours I'm, seems I'm like, you're like, Monday, what should we do tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we've got it. I, honestly, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like, I'm honestly, people just, sometimes I think I'm so, I'm like, I'm crazy sometimes the way I think. Like, I'm even, even having a conversation with you right now, I might come out of here and be like, I can, you know, I feel like shooting. So I might organize something for tomorrow and then shoot. Like, I'm very last minute. But is but, that because it's more emotional for you? Yeah, and I think I'm more I'm more spontaneous. I like being spontaneous. Mm. Like I like having, even though I kind of sometimes always say, "Oh my god, I hate it that my life's too busy." Like I need to be a bit more organised. Like I'm, um, <laughs> I was in this conversation with someone before. I was like, you know, I, I, my life is just a controlled chaos. Yeah. Like in the sense where everything's all scattered around. There's so much going on, but I kind of know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and then so all the chaos is traveling in the same direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then even like with my collections, it's like, I feel like if I was to organize, let's just say if I was to organize something too early, like January, February, by the time I've shot it, come May or June when I need to submit, I'm not going to like yeah, the collection. Like so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like sometimes when I think about things too much as well, that my true creativity doesn't come out. You kind of spoil it yourself, yeah. yeah. So... But yeah, I mean, I have an idea of what I want to do and like I always find like I want to try new things out and push the boundaries as much as possible. And even when I'm shooting my collections for the British Address Awards for myself, I really do try and hone in that it's a men's hairdressing collection. So I want to cover everything. So a lot of people that will see a lot of my collections and a lot of my work, you're always going to see I work with all hair types. So I'd work on textured hair. I'd work on longer lengths of hair. I'd work with design work, pattern, colours. Because I'm like, if I'm going to showcase me and showcase a collection that's submitting for a competition, to me, I'm like, it needs to cover everything. Mm. Um, yeah, that's just me, yeah, basically. Man. Good shout. Any tips for anyone out there thinking of setting, jumping into awards? I mean, we've got everything from the kind of one shot right yeah. the way up to 
I guess we're still kind of British hairdressing is still probably the oh, it's the no apex. No, 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 British hairdressing awards. That's the so one. you that's... know, there's a huge array out there. Any tips? Any thought processes <sighs> people need to start getting their head round? Um, I feel like with competitions and awards, I always say to people, "Why do you want to enter it? Like, what is your what is your focus for entering it?" And everyone's different and there is no wrong or right. So you're going to get people that want to enter it because they want to win. Mm. You want to win, that's fine. That's cool. There's a lot of people that will enter it because they want to create a new collection that they're proud of and they enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to enter it because they want to enjoy the journey. They want to learn and grow from it. And I think just make sure that you're entering it for the right reasons mm. more than anything um, and just be proud of it because it's like, especially if you're going to enter the British hairdressing awards, it's a very, it's a very tough competition. There's a lot of like the standards are so high, and the men's category because I judge it as well. It's just always it's the biggest category mm. out there. There's a, there's so many. There's hundreds of images to choose from, and it's such a hard one to to judge because there's so many different um, opinions and there's so many different um, collections that people can see and. I'm always just like, look, just just be proud of what you're doing. Enjoy the journey. Learn from it. Grow from it. And, you know, if you win or you get through to a final, it's amazing. If you don't, then just squash it and just move on to the next thing. It is what it is. It's life, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's only a competition because yeah, people have got to lose as yeah, well as people have got to win. You know, I always say, like, yeah. at the end of the day, there's, there's a lot more out there to British Address and Awards. But I'm you like, haven't. I mean, you haven't won everything you entered. No, but so I you got. You got. You got. Presumably, got a big pile of pictures. You use ah, them for other things. Yeah, they, of course. They I've, all have I've, a purpose. Yeah, I mean, I've. You know, you can use these pictures for like your social media stuff. You can use it for showcasing your own work. You know, I've. I've won a lot of competitions, but I've lost a shitload as mm. well. You know, and it's like, I'm always <sighs> like, I say to people, it's like, there's a lot of people that will focus solely on the British Hairdressing Awards for that. That one year or that one time where you're going to find out if you're a finalist or if you want it or not. I'm like, there's 365 days mm. of the year that you're basically just focused on. I'm like, there's other stuff. I'm like, For me, my main focus right now is always my family and my health. That's yeah. always my main focus. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'd, I'd rather focus on those things because that's going to, that's what's going to keep me like, you know, the longevity within my life. You know, fitness is such a massive part of my, my well-being now in what I do. Like, don't get me wrong, like I, I, I enjoy teaching, I enjoy traveling, but the first thing I'll always say to people that's booking me on a job, I'm like, has that hotel got a gym? Right. And then I'm like, if it has, I'm like, where, where's the nearest hotel? Has uh, that always been a thing? Or no, is that no, something no. you discovered for I along, mean, like, your way, along the way? No, nah, it's, um, I mean, a lot of people that know me on a personal level was 2019, I was fat, like I was overweight. Um, I've always kind of yo-yoed with my diet. And then basically 2019, March, um, till December 2019, I basically went through a uh, journey. I went through a, basically a nine-month transformation where I basically lost a lot of weight. And the reason why, again, going back, is my son was born 2019 in May. I basically just didn't want to be a fat dad. Yeah. So I basically just transformed myself, became fit and healthy, started training. And then even now, that it was no excuse for when I travel, when I... You know, I do what I do. I'm like, I've always got my trains that I can go for a run. There's always outside gyms. Like, I'll find something, press ups, yeah. you know, in the good hotel. Good for the man. head as well, I think. 100%. Very good for the head. And also, you now know you've got, got a good chance of winning the dad's race. Oh, mate. Yeah, when, people, when people say to me, they're like, why do you train so much? I'm like, that's sports day. I, was like, I, said, anyway, I said, that's it, game over for them. I'm like, I'm training so hard. but Love it. Yeah. Brilliant. Mate, thank you so much for coming up and speaking Pleasure. to me. I've really enjoyed that, man. Cool. Very Pleasure. good luck with everything you. else you do. Obviously, good luck with the new baby. Thank you. And enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this episode of The Noble Barber. If you liked it, please do like and subscribe. If you've got comments of what we should be doing in future, please give us your questions and we'll try and find an expert to talk to. Or if you're the expert and you want to come on here and help stay in touch, we'll get you on. Come and join us on the sofa.